Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by writer and director Eskil Vogt. And I wanted to start by asking about the visual aspects of the film, because you've really lent into these very naturalistic, warm tones, a lot of light. And I know that some of that was informed by the fact that you were filming in summer. The sun wasn't even going down till 10 p.m. after the kids who were in the film had gone to bed. Um, but what was the initial genesis of knowing that that was kind of the color palette and, and the way that you wanted to tell this story, really leaning into light rather than dark? darkness and shadows for this theme and topic? Well, it was for me, I mean, The Innocence is kind of a scary movie, depending on who's watching, how scary it is, but it's, uh, but what was the most important thing for me and my cinematographer while we were making it was that it's a movie about childhood. So, I mean, most scary movies have kind of like a black and white look, even if they're shot in color, it's very dark, it's open at night, the skin tones are almost white because you, you want everything to be uncomfortable. You want, you want everything to be kind of iconic and, and scary. And uh, we didn't want to go in that direction. We wanted to create that feeling of being a child during summer, exploring the world with your hands in that tactile, sensuous way. And the sun is shining and, and, and you have, we want those healthy, natural looking skin tones so that you would like feel you're there with the kids, that you're present, that it's real. And, and that, was, that was very important to us. So we, we kind of structured the movie around that and tried then to find other ways of creating the more unsettling feelings. Or, or yeah, it, it, we couldn't do that, the fear of the dark thing, because as you say, the sun sets at 10 p.m. and the kids have gone to bed. So we couldn't really use that. And, and you know, that always works. You know, you, you can, even in the worst horror movie, when people flip the light switch in the basement, it's not working and they say, I'll go down anyway. Now to check, uh, you, you, you feel it because it's scary. You don't see it. And, and we couldn't do that. But then again, if we manage to create that unease, it will stay with you. There's no pause. There's no sun comes up and the vampire goes to sleep moment it's constant because the the scary stuff comes from the character it comes at whenever you know you're you're, no, you're never safe You've also made such an interesting choice in terms of the age of the kids. You know, by the time kids get to 12, they start to have more of a sense of morality, the complexities around that, more of a sense of self. And it's that beginning of that journey into adulthood. And so it feels like a very specific choice that all of the kids are, are younger than that. Um, and I was interested at the point where you realized that was a real necessity in terms of capturing this story so specifically with all of the things that you're exploring. And, and also knowing that in the casting, you know, some of the ideas you had for characters, genders and ethnicity changed based on the kids you found. Was that also the case in terms of their ages or were they always set to be these specific ages? We, uh, the ages was, it was quite specific because I mean, 11 was the break off age because after that it's the tweens it's the it's the teens it's, it's another thing uh, entirely because sexuality enters the picture like gender roles it's it's, it's uh, i wanted to make a movie about childhood with like a capital c and uh, and i couldn't do that if they were going through puberty and also one thing that I, I just uh, was thinking about quite early was I was writing this. It was about the magic of childhood, about that being real. And that meant they have some powers. And then I was telling the story to my producer the first time I talked to anyone about it. And, oh, these kids and they discovered they have some powers. And I went, like, oh, no, this is what everyone is making. Everyone is making a story about uh, young people with supernatural abilities. And uh, am I making one of those? And I felt I had to like back up a bit and think and like, no, I'm making about kids, really young kids and the way that they perceive the world, world so differently from adults, that they are living in this parallel, closed off, magical world that we as adults don't have access to. And most of those other series and television shows and, and movies, they're about puberty. 
they're about, oh, what's happening to my body? You know, uh, suddenly I can do stuff I, I couldn't do before. I'm, uh, I'm ejaculating webs from my arms and I have to close the bathroom door because my aunt is knocking and want to get in. You know, it's very specifically about that period that has to do with becoming an adult and, and, and dealing with the changes. Uh, and, uh, and that wasn't my themes at all. I was making something else that made it very clear that I had to stick with young kids, even though that's much more difficult to work with, that that was the theme of this movie. And also with the powers that they develop and that we see on screen, what's really striking about it that's very different is that there's a real stillness to it. It's not about movement and motion and them kind of using their hands to command a power. It's the camera coming very close and there being a real stillness and concentration. Um, how did you make that specific creative choice and realize that that told a much more psychological story? Well, it is uh, a psychological story. It's it's uh, and also it's about uh, the magic of childhood. That the, and the, and I knew quite early that the movie would end with a big scene where the kids would have a life and death struggle, and we as spectators would know that the stakes were that high, and the kids would know, but the adults would walk right by and not notice anything. They had no idea what was going on, you know? And that meant all those effects and the way the, like the explosiveness of those powers that it had to be quite subtle. You had to keep it more on that uh, real level that kept it much closer to the characters and their inner lives and hopefully makes it more believable or relatable uh, than just having like all the windows of a uh, apartment building blow out because of some telepathic telekinetic incident you know which is i mean everyone can do that now with the vfx it's not that expensive some of the effects we are doing which is about pine needles levitating around the kids feet are just as expensive <laughs> but uh but they are kept low key so you would uh, you would buy that the uh, parents have no idea what's going on. And you brought up there that idea that the adults could be walking by even in, mm -hmm. in, in a climactic moment that's very life or death for the kids and have no idea what's at play and what's at stake for them. And it feels like that also influences a lot of the camera choices. There's a lot of moments where when we're amongst the kids, the camera's very close up on them. Um, and then if it goes into a wide shot and we see the adults, they're not part of that. They're, they're kind of never in the center of understanding everything that's going on within this circle and this friendship group. Um, was that the main genesis and reason that you wanted to kind of play with those real extreme close-ups and, and then kind of step back to those wide shots of what does it look like for everybody else passing by? Definitely one of the main reasons was, the, was to create that gulf between the adult world and the kids' world. And it was also the close-ups came from a very simple reason, which is the tactile nature of being a child, that your hands are always exploring the world. Uh, even if you're not conscious about it, you're touching stuff all the time. And me and the cinematographer, Sturla, we wanted to show that. And, you know, it, very simple observation is that cinema only have two senses. You see it and you hear it. And how do you engage the other senses? How do you make people feel in a more tactile way, what it is to be a child. And we thought those close-ups are key. If you see a child picking at the scab and putting it in her mouth, you will probably remember doing that at one point when you were a kid. And maybe that uh, physical memory will become part of your uh your the way you perceive and, and and live the character and live the movie and 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 that what we wanted to trigger that in those close-ups and uh, and then explore the dynamics of being very close to stuff and being in those wide shots where either you feel the wind in the trees and the sort of the supernatural powers in a way and also the the adult world where they don't see what's going on. 
And with that gulf between adulthood and childhood that you mentioned as well, was that also a big aspect behind a lot of the choices that you made with the sound design? Because there's a lot of instances where, you know, we're hearing the adults as like quieter voices as muffled. It's that thing of like remembering when you're a kid and you're overhearing a conversation in the next room, but you're not right in the center in the middle of it. Well, it's, uh, yeah, definitely. It's that uh, we wanted to, I mean, some people uh, put my movie in the category of like creepy kids or scary kids. Um, I understand the need to do that, but I feel in a way my movie is the opposite because those movies are always about adults looking at kids from a distance and, and like what's happening there. They seem scary. Are they possessed by a demon or a ghost or is it the devil? You know? and, and my movie is about being with the kids, being in their inner circle and the parents are in the background. And sometimes you don't even see them properly or just hear a piece of a conversation and because the way a kid perceives the adult world is very fragmented. Like you hear something there and you hear something there and you kind of piece it together, or, but you have no idea really what they're talking about or what's going on. And uh, when they come into your life and tell you stuff, they don't understand what you are doing they just come in and, and impose their will on you or try to understand you but on totally from their perspective so you can't really tell them because you wouldn't know where to begin so, so that was a very important part of yeah the sound design and the way we constructed the shots and, and where we put the camera Right. And, and with where you put the camera as well, it's something where the camera is not at adult eye level. Everything that we see, you know, the cameras at much lower angles where we're seeing what the kids are seeing, um, you know, and even going back to the idea of the close ups that you were talking about earlier, like we're really focusing in on things that kids would focus in on, you know, an object on the side is something that a kid would look at rather than what an adult would focus in at. And then there's really great use of angles as well. Like I, I just keep thinking about, you know, the poster behind you and, and the shot in the film where we see the camera looking up at the sky because that's what the kid is doing on the swing. Um, um, you know, when when did you realize the power of, of really taking the camera right into the center and having these lower angles and the impact that that would have on the story? Well, it was just it was just uh, obvious that we needed to be like eye level with the kids with some strange uh, consequences. People think that one of the girls are very tall. She's actually very, very small. And at one point you see her next to her mother, you kind of reminded, oh, she's She's, uh, she's not even a meter and a half, uh, you know, she's very, very small, but she's, she looks tall because we're always at their level and she's the tallest one. Uh, but uh, we needed to be subjective with the kids to be in their world. And that meant doing those point of views that are even childish, you know, lying upside down and looking. And then we turn the camera and we do that, you know, it's uh, uh, and, and, and be focused where the kids would look, what, what would they find interesting and try to be there and film that, even though that's not maybe the most efficient way of telling the story or moving the plot along to the scary parts. It's just, that's the priority. Get people into that perspective of being a child and see, uh, and see what happens then when it turns uh, unsettling. And coming into that perspective as well, the language of the film also has a lot to play in that. And it's, it's, it's not even, oh, thinking about how kids speak, it's that you have this range of ages and kids are so vastly different between the ages of seven and 11 in terms of language. And so how did you kind of navigate that world of, of dialogue and really making sure that each kid had a language that was unique to them as a character, but also very specifically reflected their age as well? Well, it was, I, I'm uh, well. I'm not lucky because if I didn't have kids in that age group, I probably wouldn't ever have made the movie. But it was such a privilege to, while I was writing, to have my kids around and their friends, and I would listen all day. You know, uh, I would hear kids speaking, so it was quite easy for me to write what I think is credible kids dialogue because I would hear it all the time and uh, and of course during casting we cast it was like over a year of meeting kids 
filming kids, talking to kids. And it was, uh, was also great research for, for like understanding how kids talk because they talk in a very simple way, but there's a lot of things they wouldn't say and, 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 uh, ways of of uh of talking that's very too mature for them you know so so we, you really but it doesn't mean that they're stupid you know you, you're not writing stupid characters you're just writing people who aren't haven't that level of language yet and, and that's that was fascinating and uh, and of course the kids would put some of their own way of talking into the characters but it stayed surprisingly close to the script when i was uh, uh editing and i saw what we had kept it was very close to what i had written but uh, they really felt a relationship to the characters even though all of their characters were very different from them and they were very conscious conscious about that and they, they knew that and they could separate between fictional reality and their character and themselves. And even the seven-year-old who plays Aisha, she was the youngest. She was talking about the character's motivation. And, you know, she was a real pro, you know, they knew perfectly well that they were doing a job as actors. And, uh, and, uh, and they had so much experience role-playing, you know, that's what they, maybe that's why they're so good actors that have been really been doing that a lot. So they knew perfectly well that they were acting. But of course, they brought their own personalities into the moments of the of the film. That's really fascinating. You were bringing up the the casting process, which you know was really extensive over more than a year. But also, sounds like it wasn't just about casting; it was about workshopping in the casting process with kids and and really finding kids that would bring that imagination, that would bring that realism to these characters rather than having kids that would come in and you try to evoke a specific emotion out of them that you wanted them to really have the imagination at play. Um, and I was fascinated by some of the details of, you know, like showing kids the same picture and having them tell you a story and seeing what they came up with to kind of get a sense of their inner worlds. And how did you, how did you come up with, and what were some of the, the main tools like that, that you were using to really get a sense of, of not just if they could evoke an emotion, but if they could really encapture these characters. Well, in the beginning, we, uh, I think that what we did that was the best choice I made was to not care about the characters for a long time. We just, okay, this is the age group uh, of the kids. And now let's just look for the best kids, the most interesting kids. And we will, of course, check if they had imagination, if they we had uh, exercises about like believing a fictional situation uh, you walking along a line on the floor pretend it's a cliff you know uh, and uh, that would be like one of the first tests they would do and it would like can they imagine that they might fall down or will they just walk flatly over and have no uh, no sense of drama in that you know do you believe that it's far down when they're doing it and and but we didn't work any text we didn't do any character-based stuff until we were quite far along and had really interesting actors. And at that point, I just wanted them to work, you know? So I was looking at, at this girl and she was so amazing and I will, oh, I'll, I'll switch. It was a boy in the script, I'll make it a girl, you know? And then I ended up doing that with almost all the characters. I changed either sex or essence of everyone just because I found these amazing kids and then we started exploring the characters and the emotions they needed to express what the characters are going through and we had acting workshops that were where they learned they workshop one emotion each week they were like this week it's anger bring stuff that makes you angry we'll talk about it we'll try to let go like and, and uh, when you when I say go, you are another person. You can do stuff that you wouldn't do normally. And when you're uncomfortable with it, or I say cut, that's over. And like we just and they learned so much. You know, they picked it up and they were really co really acting, collaborating. We never did that. Uh, create a real situation and uh, 
and see how they react kind of thing where we create a real surprise on set to get real reactions. I didn't want to do that because I wanted to feel comfortable and to know what was going to happen at any time so that it wouldn't be like, oh, I got this great moment of surprise, but the next day they would come on set and be like, okay, what's, what's happening now? You know, and they, I, I want them to feel okay, to feel at ease. And that was uh, the clue. But the, the best decision we did was to, to, to do a very open casting. And, uh, and just, uh, for instance, I had written, like there was one character that was 14 and that was the nonverbal autistic child because I thought I had to uh, cast an older kid because it was such a difficult demanding role. But that meant I wouldn't have seen uh, that actress and she was 10 when she came to the casting and she had this kind of absent quality when she was waiting kind of in her own world and when we talked to her and did exercises she could use that in such a convincing way and she was such an amazing actress she could pick up mannerisms from documentaries and suddenly she was doing this amazing performance and and I would have just missed her if I just had kept on looking for a 14 year old boy so that's uh that was the uh, lesson and also what I tell people when they ask how did I do that and they're doing uh, a role in their movie with a child and I, I say like I, I think the reason for bad child acting is often that you cast the, the adults first for obvious reasons you know and then you want a kid who could be her son so he has to resemble or it's the it's the adult actor at a younger age, so they have to have the same hair color or look like them. And then you have a very limited selection to choose from. And that's why you make bad choices. You know, you, you think, oh, that, that will work. We'll make that work. Instead, you could have had another actor who is, would have created magic every day, you know? And, and instead you have that uphill battle of trying to make someone work just because they have some superficial quality that you need or think you need. I think also so much of it is to do with, with everything that you were just describing mm -hmm. in terms of how you worked with the kids as well. And, you know, there are some darker themes and moments in this film and wanted to ask you about the, the conversations that you would have with them, because I know that the parents knew every detail of the film, every detail of the story before their kids were even cast so that they could make very open choices. And then you gave a lot of detail, but maybe not every single detail to the kids, but would be truthful anytime they asked you questions. And so what was that, that version that you told them in terms of giving them enough information to really, truly understand the story you wanted to tell, but maybe not kind of going into some of the darker themes and topics and what were some of the questions that they would ask you in return? Well, I, I, I didn't want to avoid the darker themes because that meant kind of lying by omission. So it was more, but what I had kids myself, so I knew I couldn't tell them the story from a to Z uh, in every detail, because after 10 minutes, they would be looking out the window and not paying attention. So it was just choosing the most important information. And that was to sit them down separately and tell them, you, I want you to play this character. And this character is that kind of person and lives in that kind of household and has this relationship to, uh, to her mother or their parents. And, and this is what that person does during the movie. And this is how he or she ends up, uh, you know, and some of them end a good place and some not so good place. And, uh, and then uh, I would say, now go home, discuss this with your parents. Don't say yes or no now and, and get back to me, you know, uh, and tell me if you want to do this. Uh, and that was the first, like, important conversation of course we knew each other very well because we had a long casting process and everything before that uh and then of course i couldn't tell every detail you know yeah, if a character died like they might not know how until the day they thought of asking me and then i would tell them or they would uh we would rehearse a stunt one day and they go oh this is how i die <laughs> <laughs> and they would have fun with that. I, and we were over prepared sometimes to, uh, the scenes that were kind of tough and, and dramatic and 
potentially traumatic. We were afraid that they might really scare them in, in a bad way. And, uh, and then when we did it or rehearsed it, we realized they had fun. You know, they, they, they thought that was great uh, to do some stunt, to act out really scared and some like very few days there were some fake blood on set you know and they wow so cool you know, they they love that and uh, and what uh, was difficult was sometimes really stupid stuff like they when they felt they missed the cue walking down the staircase and we had to do another take and they got the feeling that it was it was their fault and they suddenly I would see them tearing up and and, and like then suddenly we have a because you forget the pressure of, of performing, they want to be perfect. They, you, they have no idea how amazing they are. You know, uh, they don't know at what that level they're performing at, so they think sometimes they're not good enough. And, and that's my job then to try calm them down and, and tell them how great they are, and also take the blame for like any uh, new take that's needed you know oh we had a technical issue or I, i'm stupid i forgot something we have to do it again and not put it on them that that, that became my job and i love hearing all these details because you got such fantastic performances out of your cast and and it's such a beautifully shot film thank you so much for all of this really appreciate it well thank you